The Odor of Thought by Robert Sheckley. Leroy Clevey's real trouble started when he was taking mail ship 243 through the uncolonized Sirgan cluster. Before this, he had the usual problems of an interstellar mailman, an old ship, scored tubes, and faulty astrogation. But now, while he was taking line of direction readings, he noticed that his ship was growing uncomfortably warm. He sighed unhappily, switched on the refrigeration, and contacted the postmaster at base. He was at the extreme limit of radio contact, and the postmaster's voice floated in on a sea of static. More trouble, Cleavy? The postmaster asked, in the ominous tones of a man who writes schedules and believes in them. Oh, I don't know, Cleavy said brightly. Aside from the tubes and astrogation and wiring, everything's fine except for the insulation and refrigeration. It's a damn shame, the postmaster said, suddenly sympathetic. I know how you feel. Cleavy switched the refrigeration to full, wiped perspiration from his eyes, and decided that the postmaster only thought he knew how he felt. Haven't I asked the government for new ships over and over again? The postmaster laughed ruefully. They seem to feel that I can get the mail through in any old crate. At the moment, Cleavy wasn't interested in the postmaster's troubles. Even with the refrigeration laboring at full, the ship was overheating. Hang on a moment, he said. He went to the rear of the ship where the heat seemed to be emanating and found that three of his tanks were filled not with fuel, but with a bubbling white-hot slag. The fourth tank was rapidly undergoing the same change. Cleavy stared for a moment, turned, and sprinted to the radio. No more fuel, he said. Catalytic actions, I think. I told you we needed new tanks. I'm putting down on the first oxygen planet I can find. He pulled down the emergency manual and looked up the Sirgan cluster. There were no colonies in the group, but the oxygen worlds had been charted for future reference. What was on them, aside from oxygen, no one knew. Cleavy expected to find out if his ship stayed together long enough. I'll try 3M22, he shouted over the mounting static. Take good care of the mail, the postmaster howled back. I'm sending a ship right out. Cleavy told him what he could do with the mail, all 20 pounds of it. But the postmaster had signed off by then. Cleavy made a good landing on 3M22, exceptionally good, taking into consideration the fact that his instruments were too hot to touch. His tubes were warped by heat, and the mail sack strapped to his back hampered his movements. Mail ship 243 sailed in like a swan. Twenty feet above the planet's surface, it gave up and dropped like a stone. Cleavy held on to consciousness, although he was certain every bone in his body was broken. The sides of the ship were turning a dull red when he stumbled through the escape hatch, the mail sack still firmly strapped to his back. He staggered a hundred yards, eyes closed. Then the ship exploded and knocked him flat on his face. He stood up, took two more steps, and passed out completely. When he recovered consciousness, he was lying on a little hillside, face down in tall grass. He was in a beautiful state of shock. He felt that he was detached from his body, a pure intellect floating in the air. All worries, emotions, fears remained with his body. He was free. He looked around and saw that a small animal was passing near him. It was about the size of a squirrel, but with dull green fur. As it came close, he saw that it had no eyes or ears. This didn't surprise him. On the contrary, it seemed quite fitting. Why in hell should a squirrel have eyes or ears? Squirrels were better off not seeing the pain and torture of the world, not hearing the anguished screams of... Another animal approached, and this one was the size and shape of a timber wolf, but also colored green. Parallel evolution? It didn't matter in the total scheme of things, he decided. This one, too, was eyeless and earless, but it had a magnificent set of teeth. Cleavy watched with only faint interest. What does a pure intellect care for wolves and squirrels, eyeless or otherwise? He observed that the squirrel had frozen not more than five feet from the wolf. The wolf approached slowly. Then not three feet away, he seemed to lose the scent. He shook his head and turned a slow circle. When he moved forward again, he wasn't going in the right direction. The blind hunt the blind, Cleavy told himself, and it seemed a deep and eternal truth. As he watched, the squirrel quivered. 
The wolf whirled, pounced, and devoured it in three gulps. What large teeth wolves have, Klebe thought. Instantly, the eyeless wolf whirled and faced him. Now he's going to eat me, Klebe thought. It amused him to realize that he was the first human to be eaten on this planet. The wolf was snarling in his face when Klebe passed out again. It was evening when he recovered. Long shadows had formed over the land, and the sun was low in the sky. Klebe sat up and flexed his arms and legs experimentally. Nothing was broken. He got on one knee, groggy, but in possession of his senses. What had happened? He remembered the crash as though it were a thousand years ago. The ship had burned, he had walked away and fainted. After that, he had met a wolf and a squirrel. He climbed unsteadily to his feet and looked around. He must have dreamed that last part. If there had been a wolf, he would have been killed. Glancing down at his feet, he saw the squirrel's green tail and a little farther away, its head. He tried desperately to think. So there had been a wolf and a hungry one. If he expected to survive until the rescue ship came, he had to find out exactly what had happened and why. Neither animal had eyes or ears. How did they track each other? Smell? If so, why did the wolf have so much trouble finding the squirrel? He heard a low growl and turned. There, not 50 feet away, was something that looked like a panther. A yellow-brown, eyeless, earless panther. Damn menagerie, Klebe thought and crouched down in the tall grass. This planet was rushing him along too fast. He needed time to think. How did these animals operate? Instead of sight, did they have a sense of location? The panther began to move away. Cleavy breathed a little easier. Perhaps, if he stayed out of sight, the panther... As soon as he thought the word panther, the beast turned in his direction. What have I done? Cleavy asked himself, burrowing deeper into the grass. He can't smell me or see me or hear me. All I did was decide to stay out of his way. Head high, the panther began to pace towards him. That did it. Without eyes or ears, there was only one way the beast could have detected him. It had to be telepathic. To test his theory, he thought the word panther, identifying it automatically with the animal that was approaching him. The panther roared furiously and shortened the distance between them. In a fraction of a second, Cleavy understood a lot of things. The wolf had been tracking the squirrel by telepathy. The squirrel had frozen. Perhaps it had even stopped thinking. The wolf had been thrown off the scent until the squirrel wasn't able to keep from thinking any longer. In that case, why hadn't the wolf attacked him while he was unconscious? Perhaps he had stopped thinking, or at least stopped thinking on a wavelength that the wolf could receive. Probably there was more to it than that. Right now, his problem was the panther. The beast roared again. It was only 30 feet away and closing the distance rapidly. All he had to do, Cleavy thought, was not to think of, was to think of something else. In that way, perhaps the, well, perhaps it would lose the scent. He started to think about the girls he had ever known in painstaking detail. The panther stopped and pawed the ground doubtfully. Cleavy went on thinking about girls and ships and planets and girls and ships and everything but panthers. The panther advanced another five feet. Damn it, he thought. How do you not think of something? You think furiously about stones and rocks and people and places and things, but your mind always returns to, but you ignore that and concentrate on your sainted grandmother, your drunken old father, the bruises on your right leg. Count them, eight, count them again. Still eight. And now you glance up casually, seeing but not really recognizing the... Anyhow, it's still advancing. Cleavy found that trying not to think of something is like trying to stop an avalanche with your bare hands. He realized that the human mind couldn't be inhibited so directly and consciously as all that. It takes time and practice. He had about 15 feet left in which to learn how not to think of a... Well, there are also card games to think about. And parties and dogs... Cats, horses, mice, sheep, wolves, move away. And bruises, battleships, caves, lairs, dens, cubs, watch out, paramounts, and tantamounts, and gadabouts, and roundabouts, and roustabouts, and ins and outs, about eight feet. Meals, food, fire, fox, fur, pigs, pokes, prams, and p-p-p. The panther was about five feet away now and crouching for the spring. 
Cleavy couldn't hold back the thought any longer. Then in a burst of inspiration, he thought, Pantheress. The panther, still crouching, faced him doubtfully. Cleavy concentrated on the idea of a pantheress. He was a pantheress, and what did this panther mean by frightening her that way? He thought about his, her damn it, cubs, a warm cave, and of the pleasure of tracking down squirrels. The panther advanced slowly and rubbed against Cleavy. Cleavy thought desperately, what fine weather we've been having, and what a fine panther this chap really is. So big, so strong, and with such enormous teeth, the panther purred. Cleavy lay down and curled an imaginary tail around him and decided he was going to sleep. The panther stood by indecisively. He seemed to feel that something was wrong. He growled once deep in his throat, then turned and loped away. The sun had just set and the entire land was a deep blue. Cleavy found that he was shaking uncontrollably and on the verge of hysterical laughter. If the panther had stayed another moment, he controlled himself with an effort. It was time for some serious thinking. Probably every animal had its characteristic thought smell. A squirrel emitted one kind, a wolf another, and a human still another. The all-important question was, could he be traced only when he thought of some animal? Or could his thought patterns, like an odor, be detected even when he was not thinking of anything in particular? Apparently the panther had scented him only when he thought specifically of it. But that could be due to unfamiliarity. His alien thought smell might have confused the panther this time. He just have to wait and see. The panther probably wasn't stupid. It was just the first time that trick had been played on him. Any trick will work. Once, Cleavy lay back and stared at the sky. He was too tired to move and his bruised body ached. What would happen now at night? Did the beast continue to hunt? Or was there a truce of some sort? He didn't give a damn. To hell with squirrels, wolves, panthers, lions, tigers, and reindeer. He slept. The next morning, he was surprised to find himself still alive. So far, so good. It might be a good day after all. Cheerfully, he walked to his ship. All that was left of mail ship 243 was a pile of twisted metal strewn across the scorched earth. Cleavy found a bar of metal, hefted it, and slid it into his belt below the mail sack. It wasn't much of a weapon, but it gave him a certain confidence. The ship was a total loss. He left and began to look for food. In the surrounding countryside, there were several fruit-bearing shrubs. He sampled one warily and found it tart, but not unpleasant. He gorged himself on fruit and washed it down with water from a nearby stream. He hadn't seen any animals so far. Of course, for all he knew, they could be closing in on him now. He avoided the thought and started looking for a place to hide. His best bet was to stay out of sight until the rescue ship came. He tramped over the gentle rolling hills looking for a cliff, a tree, a cave, but the amiable landscape presented nothing larger than a six-foot shrub. By afternoon, he was tired and irritated and scanning the skies anxiously. Why wasn't the ship here? It should take no longer than a day or two, he estimated, for a fast emergency ship to reach him. If the postmaster was looking on the right planet, there was a movement in the sky. He looked up, his heart racing furiously. There was something there. It was a bird. It sailed slowly over him, balancing easily on its gigantic wings. It dipped once, then flew on. It looked amazingly like a vulture. He continued walking. In another moment, he found himself face to face with four blind wolves. That took care of one question. He could be traced by his characteristic thought smell. Evidently, the beasts of this planet had decided he wasn't too alien to eat. The wolves moved cautiously towards him. Cleavy tried the trick he had used the other day. Lifting the metal bar out of his belt, he thought of himself as a female wolf searching for her cubs. Won't one of you gentlemen help me find them? They were here only a few minutes ago. One was green, one was spotted, and the other, perhaps these wolves didn't have spotted cubs. One of them leaped at Cleavy. Cleavy struck him in midair with his bar, and the wolf staggered back. Shoulder to shoulder, the four closed in. Desperately, Cleavy tried to think himself out of existence. No use, the wolves kept on coming. Cleavy thought of a panther, 
He was a panther, a big one, and he was looking forward to a meal of wolf. That stopped them. They switched their tails anxiously, but held their ground. Cleavy growled, pawed the earth, and stalked forward. The wolves retreated, but one started to slip behind him. He moved sideways, trying to keep from being circled. It seemed that they really didn't believe him. Perhaps he didn't make a good panther. They had stopped retreating. One was behind him and the other stood firm, their tongues lolling out on their wet, open jaws. Cleavy growled ferociously and swung his club. A wolf darted back, but the one behind him sprang, landed on the mail sack and knocked him over. As they piled on, Cleavy had another inspiration. He imagined himself to be a snake, very fast, deadly, with poison fangs that could take a wolf's life in an instant. They were off him at once. Cleavy hissed and arched his boneless neck. The wolves howled angrily, but showed no inclination to attack. Then Cleavy made a mistake. He knew that he should stand firm and brazen it out, but his body had its own ideas. Involuntarily, he turned and sprinted away. The wolves loped after him, and glancing up, Cleavy could see the vultures gathering for the remains. He controlled himself and tried to become a snake again, but the wolves kept coming. The wolves loped after him, and glancing up, Cleavy could see the vultures gathering for the remains. He controlled himself and tried to become a snake again, but the wolves kept coming. The vultures overhead gave him an idea. As a spaceman, he knew what the land looked like from the air. Cleavy decided to become a bird. He imagined himself soaring, balanced easily on an updraft, looking down on the green rolling land. The wolves were confused. They ran in circles and leaped into the air. Cleavy continued soaring higher and higher, backing away slowly as he did so. Finally, he was out of sight of the wolves and it was evening. He was exhausted. He had lived through another day, but evidently his gambits were good only once. What was he going to do tomorrow if the rescue ship didn't come? After it grew dark, he lay awake for a long time, watching the sky. But all he saw were stars, and all he heard was the occasional growl of a wolf or the roar of a panther dreaming of his breakfast. Morning came too soon. Cleavy awoke still tired and unrefreshed. He lay back and waited for something to happen. Where was the rescue ship? They had had plenty of time, he decided. Why weren't they here? If they waited too long, the panther, he shouldn't have thought it. In answer, he heard a roar on his right. He stood up and moved away from the sound. He decided he'd be better off facing the wolves. He shouldn't have thought that either, because now the roar of the panther was joined by the howl of a wolf pack. Cleavy met them simultaneously in front of him. On the other side, he could make out the shapes of several wolves. For a moment, he thought they might fight it out, if the wolves jumped the panther, he could get away. But they were interested only in him. Why should they fight each other, he realized when he was around, broadcasting his fears and helplessness for all to hear. The panther moved towards him. The wolves stayed back, evidently content to take the remains. Cleavy tried the bird routine, but the panther, after hesitating a moment, kept on coming. Cleavy back towards the wolves, wishing he had something to climb. What he needed was a cliff or even a decent-sized tree. But there were shrubs. With inventiveness born of desperation, Cleavy became a six-foot shrub. He didn't really know how a shrub would think, but he did his best. He was blossoming now, and one of his roots felt a little wobbly, the result of that last storm. Still, he was a pretty good shrub, taking everything into consideration. Out of the corner of his branches, he saw the wolves stop moving. The panther circled him, sniffed, and cocked his head to one side. Really now, he thought, who would want to take a bite out of a shrub? You might have thought I was something else, but actually I'm just a shrub. You wouldn't want a mouthful of leaves, would you? And you might break a tooth on my branches. Whoever heard of panthers eating shrubs? And I am a shrub. Ask my mother. She was a shrub too. We've all been shrubs ever since the Carboniferous Age. The panther showed no signs of attacking, but he showed no signs of leaving either. Cleavy wondered if he could keep it up. What should he think about next? The beauties of spring? A nest of robins in his hair? A little bird landed on his shoulder. Isn't that nice, Cleavy thought. 
He thinks I'm a shrub, too. He's going to build a nest in my branches. That's perfectly lovely. All the other shrubs will be jealous of me. The bird tapped lightly at Cleavy's neck. Easy, Cleavy thought. Wouldn't want to kill the tree that feeds you. The bird tapped again experimentally, then setting its webbed feet firmly, proceeded to tap at Cleavy's neck with the speed of a pneumatic hammer. A damned woodpecker, Cleavy thought, trying to stay shrub-like. He noticed that the panther was suddenly restive. But after the bird had punctured his neck for the 15th time, Cleavy couldn't help himself. He picked up the bird and threw it at the panther. The panther snapped, but not in time. Outraged, the bird flew around Cleavy's head, scouting. Then it streaked away for the quieter shrubs. Instantly, Cleavy became a shrub again, but that game was over. The panther cuffed at him. Cleavy tried to run, stumbled over a wolf, and fell. With the panther growling in his ear, he knew that he was a corpse already. The panther hesitated. Cleavy now became a corpse to his melting fingertips. He had been dead for days, weeks. His blood had long since drained away. His flesh stank. All that was left was rotten decay. No sane animal would touch him, no matter how hungry it was. The panther seemed to agree. He backed away. The wolves howled hungrily, but they too were in retreat. Cleavy advanced his putrefaction several days. He concentrated on how horribly indigestible he was, how genuinely unsavory, and there was conviction in back of his thought. He honestly didn't believe he would make a good meal for anyone. The panther continued to move away, followed by the wolves. He was saved. He could go on being a corpse for the rest of his life, if necessary. And then he smelled truly rotten flesh. Looking around, he saw that an enormous bird had landed beside him. On Earth, it would have been called a vulture. Cleavy could have cried at that moment. Wouldn't anything work? The vulture waddled towards him, and Cleavy jumped to his feet and kicked it away. If he had to be eaten, it wasn't going to be by a vulture. The panther came back like a lightning bolt, and there seemed to be anger and frustration on that blank, furry face. Cleavy raised his metal bar, wishing he had a tree to climb, a gun to shoot, or even a torch to wave. A torch. He knew at once that he had found the answer. He blazed in the panther's face, and the panther backed away, squealing. Quickly, Cleavy began to burn in all directions, devouring the dry grass, setting fire to the shrubs. The panther and the wolves darted away. Now it was his turn. He should have remembered that all animals have a deep, instinctive dread of fire. By God, he was going to be the greatest fire that ever hit this place. A light breeze came up and fanned him across the rolling land. Squirrels fled from the underbrush and streaked away from him. Families of birds took flight, and panthers, wolves, and other animals ran side by side, all thought of food driven from their minds, wishing only to escape from the fire, to escape from him. Dimly, Cleavy realized that he had now become truly telepathic himself. Eyes closed, he could see on all sides of him and sense what was going on. As a roaring fire, he advanced, sweeping everything before him, and he could feel the fear in their minds as they raced away. It was fitting. Hadn't man always been the master because of his adaptability, his superior intelligence? The same results obtained here too. Proudly, he jumped a narrow stream three miles away, ignited a clump of bushes, flamed, spurted, and then he felt the first drop of water. He burned on, but the one drop became five, then 15, then 500. He was drenched, and his fuel, the grass and shrubs were soon dripping with water. He was being put out. It just wasn't fair, Cleavy thought. By rights, he should have won. He had met this planet on its own terms and beaten it, only to have an act of nature ruin everything. Cautiously, the animals were starting to return. The water poured down. The last of Cleavy's flames went out. Cleavy sighed and fainted. A damned fine job. You held onto your mail, and that's the mark of a good postman. Perhaps we can arrange a medal. Cleavy opened his eyes. The postmaster was standing over him, beaming proudly. He was lying on a bunk, and overhead he could see curving metal walls. He was on the rescue ship. What happened? He croaked. We got you just in time, the postmaster said. You'd better not move yet. 
We were almost too late. Cleavy felt the ship lift and knew that they were leaving the surface of 3M22. He staggered to the port and looked at the green land below him. It was close, the postmaster said, standing beside Cleavy and looking down. We got the ship's sprinkler system going just in time. You were standing in the center of the damnedest grass fire I've ever seen. Looking down at the unscarred green land, the postmaster seemed to have a moment of doubt. He looked again and his expression reminded Cleavy of the panther he had tricked. Say, how come you weren't burned? 